the leaves of the tree are for you. In this video, I'm going to read from You Don't Understand the Bible Because You Are Christian by Richard Gist. The link to buy it will be in the description box below. This is chapter 4, Creation Plus. And these are not my thoughts, I'm just reading in case you may find it interesting because I found it interesting. From their investigations of ancient creation stories, Robert Coote and David Ord wrote that in nearly every case they explored, the creation of the world is in fact the creation of a cult the rights of the priesthood, and in every known instance, a state priesthood. Read that again and make sure you understand it. It is basic to this chapter. With those words in mind, let us look at Genesis 1. As with other passages I have selected, the ancient Jew would have heard this story much differently than today's typical Christian. Most Christians see this as the creation account, and many will even argue for a six-day creation because of it. How far we have strayed. Scholars generally agree that the author based Genesis 1 on a Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Elish. You could look this up on the internet, but let me save you some time. Both stories begin with a formlessness to be acted upon. The sequence of creation is identical in each. Light, firmament, dry land, the sun and moon, and the human family. And in both accounts the gods rest upon completion of their tasks. Many think the Hebrews of the Babylonian exile picked up the Enuma Elish during their captivity in Babylon, but the educated class of priests and scribes in Jerusalem would have had access to it long before then. For my purposes, this is moot, because I am further ignoring this observation and moving on to my second and favorite understanding of Genesis 1. What would the ancients know that we typically do not? The creation account, parts of the Levitical law, and the sacrificial system traveled hand in hand. The priesthood made these connections so consistently that no one questioned them. Let me explain. The creation account in Genesis 1 begins with chaos, identified as waters of the deep. What is more formless than water? What is more chaotic when uncontrolled? What leaves more disorderliness in its path than a rampaging flood? Remember the story has Babylonian roots, and the Tigris and Euphrates rivers probably devastated the land more than a few times. So Genesis 1 begins with formless and uncontrollable water. Note, the Hebrews were never a seafaring people. They did not trust the uncertain world of the great sea, where the monster Leviathan lived. It, too, much resembled chaos. I can generate a sense of dis-ease when I ponder the circumstances described in the opening verses of Genesis. It was totally dark, there was a bottomless ocean, and the wind was blowing. I sense howling across its surface. Frightening. Well done, writer. What does Elohim do with the primordial chaos? He brings order to it. How? By separating the chaos into manageable and meaningful units. Notice as you read, he separates the light from the darkness, installing a dome, the firmament. He separates the waters above the dome from the waters beneath it. The waters below he separates into sea and land. He separates night from day, and also gives meaningful form to time by dividing it into the seasons, the years and the days of the week. He also makes two specific genders, male and female. The ordering continues. He creates all the distinctive species of the earth, both plant and animal, all with reproductive means by which they precisely duplicate their own kind. A cow will not give birth to a sheep, nor will a cedar produce an oak. Lines are strictly drawn. Elohim also designates specific realms for the species to inhabit, the waters for sea creatures, the air for birds, and the earth for land animals, each in its proper realm. Order out of chaos. Order, order, order. He pronounces each step as good. It is as he intends. Orderliness is good, and by inference, disorder, or chaos, is bad. Finally, God creates us humans in the divine image, whatever that means. To the priesthood, as we shall see, it was our physical nature. We were special, as Psalm 8 puts it, made a little lower than God. More than a few scholars believe the priests were describing themselves here, not the general population. The priests, after all, with their power, prestige, luxuries, and physical perfection lived like the gods. So order over chaos was God's creative process. Any departure from the established order was an invitation for the chaos to return. The possibly self-appointed task of the priesthood was to distinguish between the ordered and disordered. 
that is, between creation and chaos. For instance, Leviticus 19.19 reads, You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind, since they were commanded to reproduce according to their kind. To breed a mare with a jack to produce a mule breaks the order. The mule is disordered and therefore unclean. The verse continues, You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seeds. Again, doing so is a step into chaos. Things are to be kept separate. The verse concludes, Nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. You get the idea. Let us move on. According to Genesis, God created birds to fly above the earth and across the heavens, while ducks and geese violated this order by spending inordinate amounts of time on the water. They were disorderly, unclean. So too, the ostrich didn't fly at all, unclean. I think I could have had a great deal of fun in this priestly function of determining clean from unclean. The disordered shedding of blood was of paramount importance. The violence was not tolerated. Only the priests were ordained to shed blood, and only in a very orderly process. In the priests' view, violence and the disorderly shedding of blood was the reason God brought the flood and wiped out everything not invited into the ark. So all those clawed birds that ate flesh and thereby shed blood were deemed unclean. The lions and tigers and bears, oh my, also broke the peaceful order. God had created them vegetarian. Leviticus 11.13 offers a list of the winged offenders. A similar list exists for rats, mice, and lizards, Leviticus 11.29. Why were they unclean? Maybe the priests did not want to eat such creatures. I'm skeptic of the motives of the priesthood. I cannot say, though anthropologist Mary Douglas, somewhere in her book, Purity and Danger suggests this contradiction. The four paws on these creatures resemble hands, but are used like feet. Disorderly? Disorderly. The priests defined fish by two traits, fins and scales, Leviticus 11.9. This does not appear in the creation account, but follows the argument based on Genesis 1 nicely. Therefore, they declared those sea creatures lacking scales, like porpoises and rays, and in rivers, catfish, unclean. These animals sported skin, not scales. Also, eels, shellfish, crabs, lobsters, and others of this ilk. Water creatures all had no fins. They broke the order. Unclean. We could go on to the insects and other swarming beings, but by now you have an understanding of the process that rested on the creation account. Criteria for humans also existed. God created the human family in his own image. God was perfect without blemish. Therefore, anyone with a blemish was less than whole, less than pure. Indeed, ungodlike, and even a little less than fully human. Wow. Leviticus 21.16 lists the human blemishes. It includes the blind and the lame and those with disfigured faces or with a limb too long. A broken foot or hand was a blemish. Also unacceptable were the hunchbacks and dwarves. A simple blemish in the eyes, an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles made one unclean. So, too, did uncontrolled emissions of bodily fluids, such as oozing sores, pus, and blood. These were blemishes. No one with a blemish could be a priest, and I suspect the priests self-righteously looked down on those who did not measure up. They seemed to have been a self-important lot. Women, of course, fell into this lesser category because of their uncontrolled monthly emissions of blood. As significantly during these monthly periods, they were unable to be fruitful and multiply, additionally breaking the established order, unclean, and thus unfit for the priesthood. In like manner, homosexual activity was also considered unclean because it bypassed the command to be fruitful and multiply. Note that homosexual activity and not homosexuals was the focus. The priests had no knowledge of a community of people for whom same-sex orientation was normal. Bestiality followed suit on at least two counts. The priesthood seriously promoted these precepts. Indeed, the priesthood kept chaos at bay by identifying clean from unclean and by restoring broken order through the sacrificial system. At the heart of this system sat meat. Meat was problematic for these people because they deemed all life sacred, the gift of God. Dietary laws dealt only with the eating of meat, not with grains, fruits, or vegetables. Also, the Genesis account declared that the plants had been given to all creatures for food. The world was created vegetarian. To kill and eat violated the divinely established order, thus opening the door to chaos and creating a monumental problem for those wanting to enjoy flesh. The priests had to find a way around that problem, and they did. Following the flood, the return to chaos, God established a covenant between himself and Noah, representative of humankind, for a new beginning, Genesis 9. The covenant allowed the killing of all animals. Do you hear the collective sigh of the non-human families? 
The same priesthood that profited so handsomely from the temple's sacrificial practices wrote these passages of scripture, and I admit to having more than a little cynicism regarding these Genesis accounts. In dealing with myths, one should always ask the question, qui bono, who profits? Who profits from telling the story this way? It is also a good tool to use in the study of scripture. Clearly here, the priests profited. They became the wealthy, land-holding, meat-eating citizens of the ancient Palestinian world. So how did one kill animals without taking life? The answer? You determined that life was in the blood and you returned the blood to God sacrificially. Sacrifice preserved and returned the gift of life to God. Therefore, no wanton act of killing took place, though no one consulted the animals on this matter. With permission to kill, the next step was to determine which creatures were clean and could be eaten. Why? Because to eat an unclean animal would make the eater unclean. The priests were directed by God to make distinction between the unclean and the clean, between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that cannot be eaten. In other words, to establish separation, Leviticus 11.47. They instituted the criteria that any creature that remained as it was created was considered clean. The obviously clean creatures were described first. Any animal that has divided hooves and is cleft-footed and chews the cud, such you may eat, Leviticus 11.2. Thus, the poor horse, or the lucky horse, became unclean because it did not have a cloven hoof. The pig, because it did not chew the cud. Curiously, the rabbit also failed the cleanness test because although it chewed the cud, in the priest's estimation as described in Leviticus 11.6, it did not have hooves. Here is cause for a bit of fun. In the biblical debates of the 19th century over whether scripture should be read literally or not, some wag wrote this bit of doggerel. The bishops all have sworn to shed their blood, to prove tis true the hare doth chew the cud. O bishops, doctors, and divines beware, weak is the faith that hangs upon a hare. I will not continue with further details, but perhaps you've noticed that those animals that most perfectly met the criteria for cleanness were those most available from the area farmlands, the ox, the goat, and the sheep. Now is the time to go back and read the opening paragraph of this chapter to see if it makes more sense to you. I hope it does. So, is Genesis 1 about how God created this marvelous world? Not exactly. Rather, it is a document created to undergird, in part, Levitical law, and consequently the sacrificial system of the ancient Hebrew religion. Did the common citizens fully grasp how the account benefited the priesthood? Probably not. And not all Hebrews embraced the sacrificial system, but most everyone then recognized how the three elements, creation, law, and sacrifice, work together, which is more than we Christians generally recognize. Indeed, we miss the mark almost totally. We really are not very good at reading Hebrew slash Jewish literature. Once again, those were not my thoughts, but I thought that was interesting because I've never considered that perspective on why the animals were labeled clean or unclean. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening. Shalom. If you enjoyed this video, you can consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. You can also go to lothealing.com, and on the right-hand side, there's a little place where you can find more contact links for me. Besides Facebook, I'm also on Twitter, Google+, Steemit, MeWe, Minds, Gab.ai, and also Patreon. You can follow me on Patreon for free, but you can also donate if you want to for as little as $1 a month. Everything is appreciated. Have a great day. Chris White once coined the phrase, short-term, new world order, freakout syndrome, to explain what it's like to have your perception of the world shattered. Of course, it's not just about the shape of the world whether it's flat, round, or something else entirely. This New World Order freakout often includes now saying no to GMOs, fluoride, vaccines, and pharmaceuticals. It's a complete overhaul to your lifestyle. And trying to explain that mainstream media is just propaganda to promote false flags, division, and more can really put a strain on your relationships. Have you gotten tired of being mocked by your own family for what you share? We've all been there. Are you treated like the black sheep because of the commandments you keep? I get it. We're all trying to figure things out together, but sometimes you just have to let your family and friends be. Plant the seed and wait and see. But while you wait for them to catch up, do you wish you had someone to talk with who gets it? That's what Truth or Talk is for. Being able to discuss what's going on in your life and what you're interested in without feeling like you're going to be judged as a crazy conspiracy theorist who should be on drugs or committed. No subject is taboo, and I'd love to hear from you. Simply truthertalk.com. Simply make an appointment, and let's talk, truther. 
believe you.